This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. You have to understand, why do we have war today? There's a curse in this earth. Why do we have war today? Because the world system is backed by Satan. Satan's still here. He has not been removed, but he will be one day. The world system cannot be changed. In fact, it's keeping getting worse and worse and worse. The world system cannot be stopped, and the church will not do it. Uh, You hear Christians all the time, we're going to change the world. You're not. Jesus is going to do that. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good morning. Welcome to Student of the Word. For those of you that are just now joining us for the first time, and welcome again to Student of the Word. For those that watch each and every day, I'm excited about this week. We're going to take up the the subject of the Bible and national defense. And uh, people often wonder, what does the Bible have to say about uh, defense? Defense of your country, self-defense, you know, defending yourself, your family, those types of things. And the Bible has much to say about it. That's for mainly here on this earth while we're here. Has nothing to do with your salvation or going to heaven, but it does have to do with just uh, natural common sense as well as biblical common sense and uh, defending yourself. So we'll find out what the Word of God has to say. We'll be all week on this one because we're going to talk about war. We're going to talk about being a soldier. We're going to talk about uh, defending our country, what the Word of God has to say, the heavenly viewpoint of it, all these things. We take up many issues that you know divide liberals from conservatives in our country, but mainly just coming back to what does the Bible have to say about it? And the Bible is conservative, but you can be conservative without being a Christian. And you can be Christians without being really conservative because you don't know what the Word of God has to say. But you cannot be a disciple and be a liberal. There's just no way around it. You cannot know what the Word of God has to say on each subject and believe it and decide you want to practice it without being conservative in all of your viewpoints. Again, because not because of just you chose to be that way, but because God is that way. And we want to join him as far as his beliefs. So We'll be talking about what the Word of God has to say about it, but I just want to come back to you, and I want to tell you, if you are part of our national defense, I want to bless you, say thank you for it, because America is free, and is free because of those who have given their lives for it. And this has been the way it is throughout the time period that man has been here, is that freedom is always purchased through defense and fighting for your country and many shedding their blood for it. And so thank you for doing that, and whether you're Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, or whether you know, you're just uh, part of those uh, you know local uh, outfits that uh, work with them, you know, paramilitary organizations, thank you so much. Even police, even fire, your paramilitary. Again, thank you so much for what you do. You guys are a great blessing. And uh, I want to commend you for what you've done. My grandson's in the Air Force, of course. That just makes me proud to think about that. And uh, he hadn't been at that long, but he'd been doing really, really good in there. And again, gaining a great love for his country. So I'd like to admonish you too, if you're not a, if you're not a partner with me in this ministry, would you join me and uh, become a partner and join me in produ- uh, producing the Word of God to make disciples out of people? Yes, we get people saved. A lot of people call in and a lot of people write in. In fact, they gave their lives to Jesus. And uh, something I said helped spur them to come to that decision. But the most important thing after that is after you become a Christian, it's becoming a disciple because God put the both of them in the same thing. The Great Commission includes both of them, not just go into all the world and preach the gospel, and whoever believes will be saved. He goes on to say in Matthew 28 and add to this, he said, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. So growing in the word of God is what produces a disciple. That's the main thing my ministry is called to. And again, I thank you. Go to my website, bobbyandian.com. If you'd like to join me in becoming a partner in this ministry, I appreciate it ahead of time. Thank you for doing that. Let's go to the word of God. Today, national defense occupies a major part of the Word of God. And in spite of man's effort through all these years, there's always going to be war. And Jesus even promised it in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8. He said this, see to it that no man mislead you. That's found in verse 4. He said, be sure that no man deceive you is what your King James says. Don't be deceived into thinking we can bring peace into this earth. Verse 6 says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. These things must come to pass. He didn't say they might come to pass. He said they must come to pass. Why? Because we are in the midst of the devil's world. He occupies this earth. He runs this world system. 
and will until the Lord comes back just after the Battle of Armageddon and removes him from this planet and then brings in his own uh, reign of peace over this earth. Verse 7 says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom will rise against kingdom. Nation against nation is just strictly warfare, but kingdom against kingdom is ideologies behind it, whether uh, you know you have religious factions and different things like that and political factions. He said again, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And finally in verse 8, he said, these are just the beginnings of sorrows. And the Greek word there means birth pangs. And so we see as birth pangs get closer and closer together and become more and more intense, so is warfare. Until the time that Jesus Christ comes back, warfare is going to keep increasing in intensity and closeness. There'll be less time of peace in between. But peace is only procured. Peace is only produced through warfare. And we we talk about sitting down and, and, you know, and talking to nations. That might work once in a great while, but most of the time it does. In fact, the Bible Bible even says, and we'll get to that in this teaching, that many countries use peace uh, plans and peace meetings and uh, peace conferences to actually give a little more time to prepare for battle. And so again, this is found in the Word of God. Why don't you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 2. And I'll take a look at verse four. Uh, When Jesus comes to rule the earth, all war will be abolished and all weapons will be destroyed. Right now, it is a producer of income to produce weapons of warfare. But we have to because there's going to be war. And the Bible commends us for having factories that produce weapons of war. Here it is in Isaiah chapter two and verse four. It says, he, this is Jesus Christ, will judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. It says there's going to come a day we're going to take those spears that we have made and we're going to beat them into plowshares. And then we're going to take our swords and bring them into hooks. What this verse is saying is, is that there's going to come a time that we're going to actually melt down all this equipment and turn them into farm equipment. Because why? Everybody's going to be at peace, one with the other. And so the Isaiah said that's going to come one day when he, Jesus Christ, will come and judge all the nations. When Jesus comes back, he's going to remove the curse that's on the earth right now that came because of Adam. Adam and Eve sinned against God, opened up the door. Satan convinced them to turn against God. When they did, not only did a curse enter into them, but a curse entered into this earth. And the curse that entered into the earth entered into the dust of the ground. Everything made of dust received the curse. Some, in some areas, more of a curse than the others, such as some animals turned against each other. Some animals still have tremendous, you know, uh, we have problems with them because they are very, you know, some animals are, are rebellious and we have to really train them and all this other stuff, but some became vicious turned against others and began to eat them and uh, devour them and then even turned against human beings. Then we have snakes becoming poisonous and all these things. And in in the ground itself, we have thorns and thistles and weeds and all these other things. And so that came because of the curse that entered into the earth. Mankind received a curse because he first of all received the nature of the flesh into his body. And uh, that's what drives us towards sin, called sin in the singular. But next of all, through that open door came spiritual death and we died on the inside. So we died from the outside in basically basically because of rebellion toward uh, God and listening to Satan. So everybody born into this earth is born of Adam's fallen seed and have to die in Adam and be reborn into the Lord Jesus Christ, of which at that time you're no longer spiritually dead. You still maintain the area of the flesh, but even one day that'll be taken care of with a resurrection body because our body is the, st- is the last link we have with the dust of the ground. And because our body was made from the dust of the ground, we carry the curse that's in this earth in our physical body, even Christians. And it says in Romans chapter eight, that we who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan with nature. And so the first fruits of the spirit is the new birth. The last fruits of the new birth will be when we receive a resurrection body, which will be minus the nature of the flesh. So in the meantime, though, we have victory over it because greater is he that's in us, our spirit man, than he that's in the world and he that's in our flesh. And so when we yield to the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Isaiah tells us there's gonna come a day When Jesus will come back, he's going to remove Satan from this planet. He's going to remove all demons, fallen angels. He'll remove all unbelievers. He will remove all religion. And he's going to remove the curse that's in the earth. And the Bible says that on that day, the trees will clap their hands. Nature will rejoice. It said the oceans will clap their hands. And on that day, the curse will be removed from the earth. And Jesus Christ will rule. But until that day, there's another verse written. And I want you to look at Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3 says, in the meantime, what do we do? 
until that day comes. Remember that back in Isaiah, he said that there's coming a day we'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. But look at what we have today. Joel chapter three, verses nine and 10 says, proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears let the weak say, I am strong. In the meantime, we still need to take things of this earth, melt them down, change them, and make instruments of war out of them. And he says, until that day, this is what we need. We need companies. We need industry manufacturing weapons of war. We need technology going with it to get smarter and smarter and constantly stay a step or 10 steps ahead of our enemy and produce better weapons. Until that time, when Jesus Christ comes back, then you have to understand why do we have war today? There's a curse in this earth. Why do we have war today? Because the world system is backed by Satan. Satan's still here. He has not been removed, but he will be one day. The world system cannot be changed. In fact, it's keeping getting worse and worse and worse. The world system cannot be stopped and the church will not do it. Uh, you hear Christians all the time, we're going to change the world. You're not. Jesus is going to do that. We're going to stop the world. No, you're not. Jesus is going to do that. We haven't been called to change or to stop the world. We've been called to win souls. We have been called to take people out of the world and bring them into the church. That's what we've been called to do. In fact, the word church means the called out ones. And uh, Peter said it in the book of Acts. He said, that God has called out a people unto himself. And this is those that receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. So even when uh, Abraham was born uh, saved, he was he was asked to leave the country he was in because he'd already come out of the world. Now he needed to come out of that country that was so much a demonically backed country and a nation that was filled with witchcraft and other things like that. So we have again, that's what happened in that nation and that's what happened in Abraham. So the same thing here comes back to us. We've been called out of the world, but we still need to protect ourselves. We're not going to change the world. The world can't be changed. The world can't be stopped. The world has to be destroyed. That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to come back one day. And the reason why the world cannot be changed and the world cannot be stopped is because Satan will not change and Satan will not stop. It's attached to him. He is the very image of what drives this world system. He is the God of this world. I was watching on TV one day and they had a man on there that was very much occupied with the, with rock and roll, with all the music departments, all the stuff. And he was deeply involved in the world system, talked about the, the different organizations that back this thing, and even brought out the fact, he said, that Satan has always been the God that mankind worships, whether it's institutions of finance, it's institutions of entertainment. Uh, uh, all, he went mentioned all these different things. He said, he's the one we look to. And so again, it suddenly came to him, of course, he's the God of this world. We think of the God of this world as the one that runs the world, but he's also the God that people worship in this earth. And Satan looks so impealing. Satan looks so wonderful because what he does is he makes evil look good and good look evil. And so there's a complete opposite turn around, darkness becomes light, light becomes darkness. All this brings about, again, they said there's got that, that until that day comes when Jesus Christ comes back, we need to beat our plowshares into swords and our pruning hooks into spears. We need to keep making weapons of war until that day comes because we are going to have it. And again, what do we do during times of peace? Walk softly and carry a big stick. We carry our weapons and we even talk about our weapons so that nations will not attack us. So man will not bring lasting peace until the church age is over and the tribulation is over and the millennium begins. We'll see you right after the break. I do want you to have a copy of this book. It is excellent. In fact, one of the senators from my state read the book and his daughter completely changed her mind on capital punishment and on killing in times of war because of what the Bible said. So get yourself a copy. See you right after the break. What does the Bible have to say about war and the price of our freedom? Should Christians fight to defend their country? Is world peace even possible? In the Bible and National Defense, Bob Yandian discusses the Bible's answer to these questions as well as how we, as Christians, are to pray for our nation and our leaders. Topics include the purpose of government, crime and immorality, capital punishment, separation of church and state, and freedom and war. The strength of a nation is the people of God. By prayer and applying God's word, we can make a difference. To order the Bible and national defense, go to bobyandian.com or call 918-250-2207.
Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite or call 918-250-2207. Man will not bring in everlasting peace. Man can have all the peace conferences he wants. There's nothing wrong with a peace conference to find out what your enemies want or what they're, they're willing to say they will do to draw up a compromise. But understand this very rarely, does that compromise ever work or does it last any length of time? Look at, look at Israel. And how many times have they had peace conferences? How many times they sat down and talked with the uh, other nations around them and those who want to occupy uh, Israel with them? And they come to some agreement and then pretty soon the ceasefire is over. It's over. The, the peace plan is over and there's attacks going on all the time. The same thing is true. I remember during the Vietnam War, how many times we had the Paris Peace Accord? How many times did we meet and how many times did we talk about it and it didn't ever come to pass? And they tried, they'd have momentary peace and lay down your weapons and all that, but in just a little while, a day or two, the weapons were picked up again. So again, you cannot trust the world system, trust nations of the world. You have to come back to, again, you might have something signed and it may work from time to time, but very rarely does diplomacy really work. So so peace is purchased through military victory in the meantime. Man will not bring peace during this time of the church age, the coming tribulation. And once the tribulation's over and Jesus Christ comes back to set up his millennial reign at the Battle of Armageddon, then we're going to find out that then and only then are we going to have everlasting peace. Because again, the world system cannot be changed and it cannot be stopped. It can only be destroyed. And Jesus Christ is going to come back and destroy the armies at, at Armageddon and destroy Satan's uh, plans. And again, all, he's going to be sent to the uh, to the bottomless pit. He's going to be sent to hell. And so will all the demons, fallen angels, the sinners, all religion, and uh, again, the uh, curse will be gone off the earth, and Jesus Christ will then rule. On that day, the book of Revelation says the kingdoms of this world, notice all the kingdoms on the earth are part of Satan's kingdoms. I know the United States is part of it, but we have the best nation in the midst of the devil's world. We have more spiritual, we have more biblical concepts, we have more conservatism controlling and helping control our nation. But again, it's still called a kingdom of this world. And you say, yes, but I just think God put this this nation together. I think he was part of the forming of it, but still a kingdom of this world and will be till Jesus Christ comes back. And listen, if you think the United States is great, which I do, I think it's the best nation on earth. If you think that we look back at the past and say, nothing could be better than that. You have not even given a thought to what the millennial reign of Jesus Christ is going to be like. Because one day in the millennium, you're look around and go, my Lord, the United States was never this good good. No, because we're going to have an absolute wonderful world leader named Jesus Christ. So again, that will happen when the millennium begins. Peace is purchased through military victory. Mankind cannot produce lasting peace. Winning wars only even then brings temporary peace. But even in the time of peace, you need to prepare for upcoming wars. I was in England one time and they were talk, sitting around a table and they were all talking about the way that England is run compared to the way that the United States is run. And they began to say to us, you know, they, they said, oh, we offer free medical care. I said, no, you don't. It's taken out of your checks. You don't even see it. If you knew what you actually made and what they took out of your check, you would be shocked at how much you're paying for this health care. And then once you need it, since it's controlled by the government, it's never that good. Of course, a few heads nodded around the table and all that. And then this one man at the end of the table said to me, said, well, he said, if if the government isn't supposed to take care of your teeth and it's not supposed to take care of your body, it's not supposed to produce health, then what's the government for? I said, national defense. One man sitting at the table, an older man started crying. Tears were running down his face. He said, you know what? You're right. He said, England is in nowhere near uh, defending itself like it did in World War I, and especially, he said, in World War II where we won. He said, if there ever rose Nazism again, we are in no condition to fight it because we spend all of our money that we should be putting into uh, warfare and into national defense. 
we've been putting it into these social issues. And so again, we find that man cannot produce lasting peace. Winning wars again only brings temporary peace. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will bring eternal peace after the worst war ever seen on earth. And even Jesus said, this is the biggest war and the worst war that's ever been fought. No, never has any war been this bad, nor will any war after it be this bad. And he's referring to the battle of Armageddon. Until then, we need to teach our children about war. Look at Judges, if you would. Judges is back there where the pages are white and still stuck together. You might have to blow the dust off of it because you don't get to Judges that often. But I want you to look with me at Judges chapter 3. The book of Judges is right after about five to six to seven years after Israel came into the promised land, took over the promised land, and then the book of Judges comes because they forgot the Lord their God. Remember it was told in the book of Deuteronomy, do not forget the Lord your God when you come to the promised land. When you're digging golden brass and copper out of the hills, living in houses you did not build and eating crops you did not plant and you're living off the, the land there because you conquered it. He said, don't forget the Lord your God. Well, they did. They did forget the Lord their God. And they turned from him. And they were, and, they, and so instead of having the type of leadership God wanted, there came the time of the judges. And that's why it's called judges. And some of these judges were as carnal as could be. Samson was as carnal as could be, even though he had supernatural strength. And he was one of the judges over the nation. So in Judges chapter three, verses one and two, here's what it says. Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them. That is all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formally known it. You know what this verse is saying? It said that God, even though he told him to go in and kill all of those uh, nations and kill all of those that opposed the gospel and all of those that opposed Israel, they didn't do it, but said this was that God knew about. Now the King James says God purposely did that, is that God didn't stop it. And he knew they weren't because after a while, they began to fight and fight. They got weary of battle. They began to say, oh, well, these guys aren't so bad. We're just going to leave them. And they disobeyed God. But you know what God said? This is what's going to happen all the time. He says, and on top of that, they were there. And, I, and he said, I didn't kill them myself. He said, they were there so your children could learn about war. In other words, teaching your children to fight against the enemy is part of our natural life here on this earth and what we should be doing. And he said again, this was so the generation of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formally known it. There's children that were there at that time and there were still battles yet to be fought. And so the people backed off, began to take a whole attitude of peace. Well, you know, everything's gonna be okay. Let's just sit back and visualize a world peace and we're not gonna have fighting anymore. And we've done our part. And you know, after all, we so handily won this with God's power. Nobody will stand up against us. Don't be so cocky. It's going to happen again because we're in this world and there's always going to be wars and rumors of wars. And Jesus said, in this, don't you be upset about it for he says, I've overcome the world. Universal military training is commanded in the word of God and there's no such thing in the Bible as a volunteer army. And if you go to Israel today, from the time you turn about 14, you start working with the military and you do till you're in your 20s. After that, you're on call until you're quite older in life that if any emergency comes, you can be called right back in the military. Even when you get the point of now you're out of the military, can go back into civilian life and can run yourself a business, whatever. You always know you can be called up at any time. We were over there one time with uh, with our, our people. We've gone over seven different times to Israel and taken groups from our church. But one time we were there, This our, our guide was telling us, he said, I'm a guide. He said, but at any point, I might have to turn it over to somebody else uh, to do this because he said, I am all always on call, even though I have been out of the military for years. You know what happened? One day we came and he wasn't there. And this other guy said, I'm sorry, but he was called up during the night to go and help fight over on a particular area, a particular front for this nation. And so it isn't a voluntary thing over there. It is something that you mandatorily have to do. And the Bible teaches about this. Universal military training is commanded in the word of God. There was no such thing as a volunteer army. So pastors, have you ever wondered how to help with our national defense? Then why don't you recruit godly men and godly women to join. The, uh, to join. In fact, I don't think there's anything wrong if you can do this. I think that it can still be done. You can set yourself up as a recruiting area. You can't teach the recruits, but you can bring them in and bring them over to the recruiting office. And, and, and this was done throughout our history, that uh, those who wanted to join the military in times of battle, whether or not it was the, the battle between the states and our here and, and all the other types of battles we've had internally within the United States, is that you could join right up there in church. In fact, there was a time we're talked about 
where one of our pastors of this country was up there teaching on the importance of defending the United States. And at the end of it, he pulled off his robe that he had on underneath. He had on a military uh, outfit and uh, he told him, he gave him a military uniform and told his congregation, men, you want to join me? Come on. And a bunch of men went out with him and they joined at that time. A church is a great area to recruit people to fight for our country because you know why? God is the one who helps set up our country. It may not be that godly today. And there's so much things we need to change in our country. We need to come back to some particular standards we have. And the point of it is the United States is the best country in the world. Oh, it's still part of the world system. It's still part of the kingdoms of this world, but we are so far advanced when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to national things, when it comes to conservative values and home values. And oftentimes nations look at us, call us Pollyanna, call us all kinds of names because they say we're so Puritan. We have puritanical thinking in our country. Praise God for it. That's all I can say. Thank God for it because we have morality, more morality in the United States than many countries around the world. But it still comes back to this. We are still a kingdom of this world and we're going to have to fight nations. And America is so strong that oftentimes nations ask us to come help them and sometimes we do. But again, it comes back to this. We need to help recruit godly soldiers and that is good for a church to do that. War has always been a part of history and will continue to be while Satan is the God of this world. Ecclesiastes 3.8 says, there is a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. There's always going to be times when there comes times of hatred. You say, oh, we're not supposed to hate. Yes, we are. We're to hate evil. When Jesus Christ arose into heaven after being on this earth for 33 years and sat down at the right hand of the Father, the Father said to him, enter into the joy of the Lord. And he said, because you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Love and hate go hand in hand. Love what should be loved and hate what should be hate. Hating the works of Satan. Hating sickness, hating disease, even the world calls cancer an enemy. We have days we fight breast cancer and we fight Alzheimer's and all these things because you know why the world even realizes it's an enemy. It takes a stupid Christian to think God sent this into your life and somehow it's your friend and cancer is your friend and God used it to teach you something. If you did that to your own child and had the power to do it, you would be called a wicked parent. You would be called there a child abuser. God is not a child abuser. But here we're told that again, there is a time to hate, there is a time to love, and there is a time of war and there is a time of peace. In fact, in Numbers chapter 21 and verse 14, it says this, God keeps a record book of just wars. There are wars that are just. Not all wars are evil. Not all wars are done out of, out of wrong things, although some have. And we have nations rise against nations simply because they want to steal everything they have and come in and dominate people. And the powerless comes over them and the, and the uh, lust for riches come over them. So they'll attack a nation that seems weak just for that. That is evil. But sometimes there's times when nations go to war for reasons. One side might rise up in evil, but another side comes for national defense. And in Numbers chapter 21 and verse 14, it says, it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, there is a book recorded of just wars and men who fight in war. In fact, we're going to find out later on in uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews of the heroes of faith. There's a sec there's a certain section of that dedicated to those who are valiant in battle. We will see you tomorrow as we continue on the subject. Please get a copy of this book. You will greatly appreciate it. The Bible and National Defense. Fence. We'll see you tomorrow. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.